we are live a very good evening everyone welcome to i focus online episode 316 back to basics episode 7 uh, 6 and today we have with us everyone's uh, beloved teacher dr santosh navar sir from center for site hyderabad talking to us on essentials of ct scan for an ophthalmologist and also we have on our panel dr ravi vama sir and hope the uh, discussion is really interesting for all our audiences uh, over to you sir thank you sir fully good evening last uh, in wednesday you had a very elaborate class on mri scan now i'm talking about its poor cousin ct scan ct scan is not really such a poor cousin of mri it's very useful and as ophthalmologists we are more used to reading ct scans than interpreting mri scans ct interpretation of ct scans is fairly easier as compared to mri and often times it's the most basic investigation that most of the ophthalmologists have access to mri being little more expensive and also takes time to get access to now before i begin i would like to ask one of you one of the fellows to do properly as to if you look at this particular scan uh, would you be able to diagnose this patient do you yes yeah i'm just going to show you this scan this is a coronal scan right don't make a face yeah please sir i am not able to see um, right no. can't you see this scan so we can see it's visible you can see no yes okay. all right then shefali you can take it if you uh, can it's a ct a coronal uh, scan ct scan hmm. shows hmm. Uh, in the right eye uh, there is a dilated uh, superior ophthalmic vein that i can see uh, yeah so uh, probably uh, superior ophthalmic vein uh, is dilated here so maybe cavernous sinus thrombosis can be a diagnosis why if if it's just a dilated superior ophthalmic vein why do you say it is cavernous sinus thrombosis so uh, yeah in yeah it is one of the reasons sir but why how can you say cavernous sinus thrombosis here is that possible to say um muscles what about this hmm what's that so that's uh normal superior ophthalmic yes sir this scan is with contrast hmm right Yes, so it is, yeah, it's filled with contrast. Whereas on the right side, what is happening? So there's no uh, contrast enhancement seen, and it's right. dilatation. So if it were to be say keratico cavernous fistula, then would you find that the vein would be filled with contrast or not? Mm. It would be right. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Whereas here good. it is not right. So it is. Mm. not to cavernous fistula but cavernous vein cavernous sinus thrombosis okay, this is the picture of the patient patient had a boil on the nose she scratched everything is there in this patient and she presented with acute proptosis with complete ophthalmoplegia and that is how a clinical presentation is and that such a life threatening condition you could diagnose just by looking at one coronal ct scan so ct scan is very important in a routine clinical situation now what about this subha what do you think is this and what do you expect in this patient uh, sir uh, there is a defect in the bony wall involving the greater wing of the sphenoid hmm and also the lesser wing so probably it is a case of a neurofibromatosis what do you expect in such a patient <clears throat> transmitted pulsations from the lobe of the brain we expect a pulsatile proptosis sir. okay and what sign is this called it's a bare orbit sign and you would possibly expect this as well right in ophthalmos so in a patient who has a bare orbit sign you can expect expect one is pulsatile proptosis second the patient may even have an in ophthalmos this is exactly how this patient 
manifested. Now, this is a historical picture. Ruju, what do you think does this picture have relationship to in terms of what I am talking today? Who are these people? Interesting people. The Beatles. Anybody else? Chef Ali, Beatles? The Beatles, yeah. Okay. Mm. How do they figure in here? Their funds contributed to the development of CT. Okay. So, how? Yeah. Their albums were distributed by a company called EMI Graphics, which was also into some of the electrical inventions, right? Mm. So, some of their funds were ploughed in and that resulted in invention of the CT scan. And who is this individual? Mm -hmm. Hounsfield, sir. Hounsfield, absolutely right. So, he is here with his first CT scan machine, which was commissioned on, do you remember the date? Before you are born, after you are born, before your father was born? When was this? How many years ago, you think? 30 years back. 1970. 1971. 1971. October 1st, 1971. And what about this, this image? Historic. This is the first medical image obtained using a CT scan of a lady who had a tumor in the brain. This took few hours for them to acquire this one particular image. That's how laborious using a CT scan used to be at that time. This is the most historic image. You can see how much of pixelation is there because of averaging artifacts. But nevertheless, you can still see the tumor. Now, the role of CT scan in ophthalmology are many folds. It will tell you where exactly a particular lesion is, what is the extent of the lesion. It can also tell you the effect on adjacent structures. Of course, that's an MRI. But here you can see that the optic nerve is gently pushed towards the medial side by this dermoid that you see on the lateral side. It will also tell you tissue composition. For example, this particular lesion has variegated tissue composition. It will tell you the diagnosis because many a times the characteristic features of the lesion are revealed by the CT scan, not always. And it will help you plan surgical approach from which side of the orbit would you access it, whether you want to cut the bone, etc. All this information can be derived from the CT scan. Plane radiography is very simple where depending on the density of the object, it casts shadow and that is picked up on the X-ray plate, whereas principle of CT scan is slightly different. It involves a lot of mathematical computerized calculations and a lot of averaging. Now, without going into the physics of the CT scan, let's go on to the clinical aspect. What are the common indications? The most important indication for a CT scan from oculoplasty ophthalmology perspective would be unexplained proptosis, ptosis, or ophthalmoplegia. From the trauma perspective, it would be a orbital foreign body. In fact, MRI can be contraindicated in the presence of an unknown orbital foreign body or an intraocular foreign body because we don't know whether it is magnetic or not when the patient comes with a history of trauma. Any orbital mass is an indication for a CT scan. Any patient with orbital cellulitis or preceptal cellulitis with orbital signs. If a patient has purely preceptal cellulitis, then generally there is no indication for imaging. Any patient with orbital trauma, acute orbital trauma, you have ready access to CT scan and that is often the screening tool that we employ for orbital trauma. And it is very important when the patient has an orbital fracture to see where exactly is the fracture and what kind of intervention, intervention that you would want to do. Unexplained efferent dysfunction, MRI is of course the uh, imaging of choice, but CT scan can be done. Any patient with ocular surface or eyelid tumors with suspected orbital extension, intraocular tumor presenting with proptosis to rule out orbital extension, and any patient with orbital signs with paranasal sinus disease. All these are indications for orbital imaging. 
Some of the special indications happen to be in patients who have an anophthalmic socket. Like this patient has an orbital implant. You can see a orbital implant which is decentered inferiorly in the left side, but the patient has contracted socket. This is of course acquired anophthalmic contracted socket following enucleation where a suboptimally sized implant has been placed. And in such situations, before you plan to do something further, you can always look at the size of the orbit and also measure the volume of the orbit on CT scan. Here it is clear that the right orbit measures 34 cc and the left orbit lags behind because of suboptimally developed orbit due to uh, implant which is very small in size and it, and it is displaced as well. Now, uh, how all would you, what all would you, um, terms would you use to, uh, when you write a prescription for a CT scan? Ruju, can you answer this question? What all would be there in your prescription? Yes, sir. Uh, first, CT uh, scan the... or request a CT scan? You never order an investigation. You request for an investigation. And whenever you request for an investigation, what all would you mention in your prescription? So, so basically, uh, the cuts, uh, the size of the cuts which uh, we require. So you not mention the side and the diagnosis, clinical diagnosis on top. Yes, sir. So mm -hmm. first, uh, with patient identification, uh, the name of the patient, the age of the patient, probable diagnosis, what would we like to uh, know uh, further about that case? And um, with that, uh, the uh, uh, size of the cuts and uh, Hansful units, we would like to know. That's all, is it? In a prescription, what all would you write? Apart from the initial things that you mentioned, which are all very relevant, a very brief history of the patient and as to what exactly are you suspecting clinically, isn't it? And how urgent the scan is for you, right? Sometimes it's a scan that you would need in an hour. Sometimes you can wait for a week. So you should mention urgency for sure in the prescription and also call up the radiologist in case it is an, really an urgent scan. Otherwise, they would do a routine scan and may take time to report it. But what all would you write in the prescription itself? Whether it should be with or without contrast. Okay. Uh, the cuts, the axial coronal, if we are requiring uh, sagittal reconstruction about okay. that. Okay. Mm -hmm. 3D reconstruction is required just to mm -hmm. see around that. Um, That's it. Mm -hmm. So you all uh, start with slice thickness. The range of slice thickness is 1 to 10 millimeter. For routine, routine evaluation, 2 millimeter cuts are required. The disadvantage of thin slices used to be high radiation dose, more number of slices that are required, resulting in longer examination time. But spiral acquisition has reduced these disadvantages. For optic nerve evaluation, you would still prefer a one millimeter cut. For routine orbital evaluation, two millimeter cuts are important because lesions may be very small in size. And if you have a larger cut, then you may miss a small lesion between two cuts. So slice thickness, you should mention for orbit as two millimeter. And if you're evaluating specifically the optic nerve itself, then one millimeter is ideal. You should ask for contrast enhancement if you're looking for uh, a particular lesion to be a vascular lesion or you want to know the blood supply. Uh, for an orbital fracture, obviously contrast is not required, but for a vascular tumor like this, contrast CT scan gives us a lot of information about the vascularity of the lesion and also the surgical implications. Now, imaging plane, you have to ask for axial, coronal and if at all you need sagittal reconstruction. So axial, uh, as you know, is uh, parallel to the uh, orbit, whereas coronal is not really perpendicular to the axial plane. It is at a particular angle so that you can avoid some of the artifacts because of metallic filling in the teeth, etc. It's at about 70 to 75 degree angle. Now, you also ask for tissue window, soft tissue window and bone window as appropriate. Like this particular patient, you can see in soft tissue window, you see the entire eye, the lens is seen very clearly and the tumor is seen in all hue of gray, whereas there is some disturbance in the audio. Yeah, whereas the bone is seen absolutely pearly white. The internal architecture of the bone is not seen at all. Whereas in bone window, you see everything around the eye as a 
mass of gray, whereas internal architecture of the bone is seen very vividly. The importance of it is that if you have, say, if you don't have access to MRI and if you have only CT scan to kind of help manage the patient and you have a patient with adenoid cystic carcinoma of the lacrimal gland and you want to know whether the bone is involved or not. If you just get a bone window, then it will not tell you much about the tumor itself. If you get only a soft tissue window, it will not tell you much about the bone involvement. Whereas if you get both, you'll have reasonable amount of information to even operate on that patient without a need for MRI if you cannot get one. This is one more example of a patient where there is soft tissue window and bone window. In bone window, we see the internal architecture of the bone fairly vividly, whereas the eye itself gets lost in all of grayness. Modification of the procedure is very important because if a patient is suspected to have, say, orbital varices, then you have to instruct the radiology technician or request the radiologist to have the patient perform Valsalva maneuver and that is important, otherwise the lesion may be lost if the patient doesn't perform one. And if at all you want anterior visual pathway visualization, you should mention that. And the extent of imaging also you should mention. This is one example of a patient where there is subtle uh, enhancement in the amount of proptosis when she attempts Valsalva maneuver. So simultaneous brain CT scan is requested when a patient has bilateral retinoblastoma. Of course, the most preferred investigation for bilateral retinoblastoma or even unilateral retinoblastoma is MRI, but if there is no excess, then only you rely on a CT scan. Trauma, you definitely want a brain uh, imaging along with orbital imaging, suspected pericellar lesions, and suspected neurocystosurposis with orbital component. So 3D images may be important if you're planning orbital fracture reconstruction or if you have a complex clinical situation like this where you really want to reconstruct the orbit optimally, then you would need to know the distorted anatomy of the orbit and also the mirroring normal anatomy of the contralateral orbit. So you would want a 3D reconstruction. One more indication for a 3D reconstruction is just for fun like this. What is the diagnosis here, Ruju? Implant, sir. Yeah, it's a very well-centered orbital implant on the right side, left side being normal. And what about this? What do you think is the indication here? So, uh, dermoid. 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 dermoid with? Dumbbell extension, anything. Yeah, you can see a small defect in the bone there through which the lesion is, a small component of the lesion is extra orbital. So if you have a derm dermoid which is not mobile at all or fixed in one of the directions, suppose you want to move it horizontally and vertically, it, is, it has limited mobility in one of the directions or fixed completely, then you would want to rule out periosteal extension or uh, sutural extension because if you don't detect that in preoperatively, then intraoperatively, you might land up with a surplus situation where the dermoid may rupture or you may not excise it completely, leaving residual behind, which may result in recurrence or fistula formation. So you'd like to know whether there is sutural extension, sutural effacement or dilatation and extension of the dermoid through the sutures or extraorbital extension. And uh, exact localization is possible when you have a 3D reconstructed image. Now, what all information does a CT plate contain. So, of course, you'll have patient data, whether it's a plane or a contrast CT scan. You'll also have laterality information, some of the older generation CT scans. Even now, some of the patients come with CT scans done in uh, tier 2, tier 3 CTs, where the, uh, in coronal scans, the laterality is reversed. That used to be the situation earlier, no longer so with newer generation machines. Uh, then some of the technical parameters. Now, so these import, this is important because in a, a hospital, if a patient can um, you know, be mistaken for another, then even in a CT scan, you may get a wrong scan. So it's very important to identify the name of the patient and the medical record number on the scan if it is that is available and also correlate with the patient age and date of birth if that is available. Plane or contrast, as I mentioned, and laterality. This is one example of a patient where a patient came with uh, externally done CT scan and you can see that the mass is on the right side in axial scans whereas in coronal it's gone to the left side. So that kind of a lateral inversion was there in some of the older generation CT scan and you should be very careful. And uh, this is the normal orientation of an axial scan. 
So when a when a patient has an axial scan, the first thing that you look for is the scout film. What do those parallel lines indicate? Ruju? So the radiation delivery. Uh... Well, no, no, this is CT scan. That is the extent of imaging done. Right? That's a scout film. For each of these, there would be a slice here. So always oriented from inferior most to the superior most area ima imaged. For example, this is the inferior most one, and that scan corresponds to this. This is the superior most image, and this scan corresponds to it. So it's always imaged from images are arranged in that fashion, inferior most to the superior most. So in the inferior most cut, you'll see more of sinuses, more of air. Whereas in the superior most cut, you will find more of brain. So can you identify these structures, Subha, each one of these? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. That is? This. That's the eyeball. Okay. And this is? The inferior orbital fissure. Okay. This is? The maxillary sinus. Okay. And what about this? Nasolacrimal uh, canal. Okay, nasolacrimal duct. Duct. Right. Canal. Fine. So, wh what is the importance of looking at the NLD? What are the abnormalities that you may find in the nasolacrimal canal? Um, what if it is opaque, hazy, grey? Yeah, it may be bony, it is not canalized. No, 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 no. What if it is hazy, grey? Oval or red, but hazy gray. Possibly it is nasolacrimal duct obstruction. What if the edges are serrated and if it is larger? Extension of a malignancy into. Right, extension of a tumor through the nasolacrimal duct. So it can give you a lot of information. And if it is very small in a patient with congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction, that means that the bony canal itself is narrow and the patient may or may not work in probing. If it is completely absent in a patient with congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction, that means that the patient has agenesis of the nasolacrimal duct. So there is no point doing probing. But of course, subjecting them, uh, these kids to CT scan, all of them would be superfluous. So basically, we reserve these investigations in children with congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction only to failures so that you can know what is the reason for failure and when exactly would you want to do a DCR. Now, in the uh, normal mid-axial scan, there are many structures that you see. Uh, Ruju, can you take this? Can you name these structures? What about this? So, uh... What structure is that? Spinoid sinus. Yeah, spinoid sinus. And what about this? What is that? And what is this? Um, that is optic canal. Okay, and lateral to it is? Superior orbital fissure. Correct. And of course, you see the optic nerve very vividly. You see the medial rectus, you see the lateral rectus and part of the lacrimal gland. So mid-axial scan is very important for us. And um, normal upper axial scan is also important. It also shows many structures, mainly the superior ophthalmic vein, which crosses over like this. You see superior rectus LPS complex. Sometimes it may look bulbous like this. In a patient with thyroid disease, SR LPS complex may be so large and enlarged enlarge in such a way that it may simulate a tumor. So many patients come referred as tumors, but they actually have enlarged superior rectus LPS complex, which may look like a tumor in a normal upper in an upper axial scan. And what about this? What comes supranasally? Trochlea. Trochlea, right? So you see all this in the upper axial scan. In coronal scan, the orientation is from anterior to posterior. This is the anterior most scan and this is the posterior most scan and you follow the same orientation. 
can you name the structure shefali in this so the this is so this is a lateral rectus lateral rectus medial rectus inferior rectus srlps complex and this is a lacrimal gland lacrimal gland and this is optic nerve ha huh? optic nerve how so anterior the superior ophthalmic vein okay all right and this is uh the maxillary sinus okay this is ethmoid sinus perfect so let's go to the next one and what structure do you see that is pointed out by the white arrow mm. inferior orbital fissure and you see all the extraocular muscles as we go more posteriorly you see them all crowded up and a large maxillary sinus this is a very important scan because here you see both the superior orbital fissure as well as the inferior orbital fissure this is the superior orbital fissure this is the inferior orbital fissure and you see a well rounded nice optic canal so the difference of caliber in the optic nerve optic canal 1 to 2 mm difference between the two or obliteration of the optic nerve canal itself can tell you about the status of the optic nerve so this is an indirect indicator but of course if there is a fracture that can be very vividly seen in a scan like this now technical parameters are many but you really don't worry about technical parameters so much but we concentrate on some of them such as hounsfield number window width window level to see uh, what is the um, uh, spectrum of the hounsfield number that has been uh, imaged measurement scale is always built in you also look at the slice thickness scan time table position etc are not important this is a table that shows the hounsfield number corresponding to some of the uh, tissues air has the least minus 1000 hounsfield units whereas bone has the maximum 300 to 1000 hounsfield units everything else comes somewhere in between fat is rare like 100 hounsfield units water is zero soft tissue ranges from about 30 to 50 40 hounsfield units blood is 70 to 80 depending on the age of blood whether it is old blood or it's fresh bleed calcium is more than 100 metal is more than 300 and bone is the highest so based on the hounsfield unit you can actually suspect what structure that you are looking at and what abnormal uh, lesion that you are looking at cataract is lens is very high it's about 140 150 vitreous cavity has a hounsfield unit of about 20 so if vitreous cavity is seen and the hounsfield unit that is shown is about uh, 70 then you suspect that the patient may have a vitreous hemorrhage vitreous cavity is slightly hazy and you also find that uh, part of it has a hounsfield unit of about uh, 100 and part of it which has about 60 70 that means that you have a calcified lesion with uh, say which is hemorrhage within it so you you will get a gross information as to what is the nature of the tissue that you are looking at again coming to soft tissue window and bone window this is a concept that we as ophthalmologists may not really want to understand but this is called window level and window width for example if window level is 50 and window width is 100 that means on either side of 50 it has been imaged that means 0 to 100 hounsfield units right everything else is in shades of gray whereas 0 would be jet black and 100 would be pearly white right so for example if this window width is 100 and window level is 50 that means that this black that you see is less than 0 or 0 this white you see is 100 or more than 100 and everything else is at various levels of gray right so for a bone window the spectrum would be much higher as you see here so that is the level of that is a kind of concept between window width and window level now how to read a ct scan systematically you definitely need a viewing box of course you can use a cd and a computer but we are used to viewing a film as ophthalmologists and conventionally of course you can change your word to viewing it on a system but this is a very nice way of looking at the scans all of them put together in one viewing box so that you really don't have to keep flipping from 
one print to another. And you can also have a small geometrical device that's a divider to relatively measure the size. So if the scale is not built into the city image, you can always use a divider. You know the axial length of the eye anyway. You can use a proportionate scale to roughly measure the size of the lesion if it is not already given in the scan. Systematic evaluation for an ophthalmologist would start from looking at the bony orbit first. You don't jump to the lesion first. You very carefully look at the bony orbit, look if there is any bony abnormality at all or not, because that may have a bearing on what the lesion that you're looking at. Then you look at the eyeball. So first the bony orbit, then you look at the eyeball, then you go to extraocular muscles. Look at each muscle critically. If each muscle is... You know, you look at the thickness of the muscle and also the contour of the muscle. For example, medial rectus is supposed to be straight, hugging the medial orbit. Suppose it is buckled into the medial orbital wall. That means that possibly there's a defect in the bone that is causing it, right? Similarly, inferior rectus, if this the uh, scan, inferior rectus has an orientation which is slightly oblique. If it is oriented in a different way uh, to its normal orientation and there is a kind of um, opacity in the paranasal sinus, its maxillary sinus, you may suspect that there is an orbital fracture, which is of course a very evident, but you have to look at the size of the uh, extraocular muscles and also their orientation. Lateral rectus is supposed to very gently hug the lateral orbital wall, but if it is displaced, you will know when you look at it carefully. Then you look at the extraconal tissues, then the intraconal tissues, and finally, cella and paracellar region. In bony orbit, you're supposed to note all these, the dimension of the bony orbit. And what about the orbital wall? Now, what has happened to this orbital wall? What do you call this? Uh, Fossa formation. Fossa formation or scalloping. Whereas if this orbital wall were to have this irregular edge serrations, then you call it? You can call it erosion. Whereas what has happened to this orbital wall? See, normal lateral wall has this kind of a sinusoidal curve, isn't it? It's lost here, right? This is effaced. You can see that even the medial orbital wall, which is supposed to be straight, is slightly concave because of a long-standing tumor. So if it's a benign long-standing tumor, that leads to effacement and also fossa formation, where if it's a malignant tumor or the tumor that involves the bone, that you then you find erosion of the bone. Then you look at the orbital apex, then you look at all the structures which you can easily make out by looking at various CT scans at various levels. Superior orbital fissure, we already told you as to where to look for it. Inferior orbital fissure, where to look for it. And the optic canal. So you look at all the bony structures one by one. Now some of the clinical interpretations. What do you think is this? We talked about extraocular muscles, isn't it? Now what has happened to extraocular muscle here? Shefali. Um, so the left, uh, in the left eye, uh, the extraocular muscle appears to be thickened. It's bulky. Hmm? So it's slightly bulkier than the right one. What did I first ask you to look at? The bony orbit. At... Bony orbit. Bony orbit is fine. And when you look at the extraocular muscle, you're supposed to look at the contour of the extraocular muscle and the thickness. Hmm. Compare each extraocular muscle to the other side and see if there is any different effect in the contour of the muscle itself, the course of the muscle. Uh, what is the medial rectus supposed to be? Perpendicular, hugging the medial wall. Is that so in the left side? So it's uh, slightly shifted towards the sinus. From it is right. Okay. And also medial wall of the orbit itself has shifted more medially and medial rectus is bowing into it, indicating that there's a medial orbital wall fracture. This one, Tuju? Sir, it's a uh, orbital floor fracture with uh, teardrop sign and mm -hmm. uh, entrapment of inferior rectus muscle. Okay, so this angulation that I mentioned should be noted here. You can see that the inferior rectus muscle is obliquely oriented in this section. It's like that. It is actually parallel to the 
floor at that level. Whereas here, if you look at it, inferior rectus is jumping into the fracture, right? So its orientation is totally lost. It is no longer parallel to the orbital wall. Suppose you found the inferior rectus here still, right? And teardrop sign, that means that at least radiologically, inferior rectus is not directly in the maxillary sinus. It's not prolapsed. It is still in the orbit, right? So that is something that easily can recover. If this patient were to have extraocular motility restriction, possibly you may not consider surgery unless the prolapse of the orbital fat is so much that the patient has enough thalamus or there is secondary tethering of the inferior rectus to the prolapsed orbital fat causing some kind of mechanical restriction. Right? Looking at the orientation of the muscles is important. Now, what about this, Subha? We're still at the bony orbit. Uh, yes, sir. Hmm. It's a sino-nasal, uh, uh, orbital disease. No, what has happened? You just first describe this uh, abnormality that you see, then you can talk about the lesion if you can. What has happened to the medial wall? There is a breach in the medial wall of the orbit. With something from the sinus that is protruding into the orbit. orbit. Right? So, and that seems to be having a very smooth, rounded contour. This patient has proptosis of acute onset, which is suddenly increased over the last six hours. And he's in severe pain. So, this is a new finding in this patient, which was not there yesterday or six hours ago. So he seems to have developed a subperiosteal abscess because of a smooth contour. So the patient has purulent sinusitis. Now he has a breach in the medial wall resulting in subperiosteal abscess. So this we already talked about looking at each of the structures. Now in the eyeball, you look at the outer coat of the eyeball first. Is there any breach in integrity of the sclera first? Like this patient has breach in integrity of the sclera. So you should see sclera as a well-rounded structure, which is dense. And you look at the lens also. Some patients may have lens missing. Some patients may have lens which is absolutely opaque. Like this patient has a lens which is opaque, whereas this patient has lens missing. And the lens is subluxated posteriorly. You may also find tumors and foreign bodies. What about this, Ruju? What do you think is this? Sir, it's a, a bilateral uh, calcification is seen, intraocular hmm. calcification is seen, uh, most likely suggestive of retinoblastoma. Bilateral intraocular calcification with, again, a soft tissue mass suggestive of retinoblastoma and this intraocular calcification is within the vitreous cavity. That is very important. What is the nature of the calcification? Is it just a speck of calcification or... Is it a diffuse large area of calcification or is it just a calcification localized to a particular area such as say optic nerve head? Is it calcification which is localized to potential area of insertion of the extraocular muscle? Whether it is a calcification which is kind of concentric to the wall of the eye is there the hyperdense area, which is a very well, nicely circumscribed area within the center of the vitreous cavity without any soft tissue mass around it or lesion around it? All these are very important. Starting from the last, if there is a very well circumscribed uh, high density structure within the middle of the vitreous, and it causes some kind of uh, artifactual changes posterior to it, Right? Patient may or may not give a history of trauma, you would still consider a foreign body. Whereas if it is at the optic nerve head, if this is the optic nerve, and if it is at the optic nerve head, a dense uh, entity, then you would possibly be looking at an optic nerve head drusen. Whereas if it is at the potential site of insertion of an extraocular muscle, then that's a Kogan's plaque. Whereas if it is concentric calcification, surrounding or concentric to the sclera, that means it's sclerochoroidal calcification, possibly it is in a netrophic bulbi that there is dystrophic calcification. Whereas intraocular calcification like this, you see in not many 
many situations except ectoblastoma. Coats may have calcification, and that would be mostly specks of calcification, not diffuse calcification. Calcification can also be found in some of the patients who have Patos syndrome, right? And also in patients who have, uh, say, um, you can name the syndrome. You know this. Patients come with pearl patches. Patients come with complex choristoma. Nevis of iodism. Nevis sebaceous of iodism. So these are the situations where patients may have intraocular calcification. Now what about this? Somebody interpreted this as a thysicali following trauma. Would you agree with the diagnosis? You can't, you can't see the tumor at all. You can't see anything beyond the cornea because cornea is totally opaque, disorganized. But on CT scan, you find that there is intraocular lumpy calcification with some kind of a soft tissue shadow. And also the optic nerve seems to be thickened. So this is a clear cut case of retinoblastoma. Although the patient has come with a history of trauma with eyelid edema, etc., still lingering on, which is reducing over a period of time. This patient possibly had retinoblastoma with sterile orbital cellulitis, which is the cause for this eyelid edema, which is reducing now on systemic steroids. But patient does have signs of intraocular tumor. So what do you think is this? I told you in the first slide, I have to look for the location of calcification. Where is this located? Optic nerve head. Optic nerve head, no. Temporal to the optic nerve head. Some part of it is here, at least it is on the optic nerve and extending slightly more temporal to it. So this is bilateral and this is plug cord, not nodular. So this is more likely to be choroidal osteoma because it is plug cord, not like this. This is spheroid, which is right on the optic nerve head. And this is likely to be optic disc drusen. And this is Kogan's plaque. Kogan's plaque. Okay. So, patient, you know, ophthalmologists who are oriented more towards cataract would jump towards, oh, this is a juicy, white, dense cataract, whereas left eye has pseudophagia. But being my fellows, you would obviously jump to a Kogan's plaque. Kogan's plaque is nothing but calcification at the insertion of the horizontal rectal muscles. Right. So, now what is the implication of it? If you find a patient with Coben's plaque, then what do you find? What else would you find which has a great implication on your clinical diagnosis? This is just an external curiosity sign. Coben's plaque is a curiosity sign. It's a good thing to teach residents and fellows, oh, this is Coben's plaque. But what do you what is the implication as an ocular oncologist for you? It can be associated with idiopathic sclerochoroidal calcification. Absolutely right. So these patients with idiopathic sclerochoroidal calcification may come with yellowish white lesions in the mid periphery of the fundus, not really corresponding to the Kogan plaque that they have. And it may actually look like choroidal metastasis. And the age is absolutely same. Idiopathic sclerochoroidal calcification, Kogan's plaque, everything is seen in elderly ladies. And they also have a systemic association, which is Barlett syndrome, right? Which is magnesium metabolism abnormality. abnormality. So you please read up sclerochoroidal calcification. It's no longer idiopathic. It is associated with syndromes. And uh, one of the signs that you see is Hogan's plaque on CT scan or clinically also. This is one more patient with bilateral Hogan's plaque and also idiopathic calcification of the lacrimal gland. And what about this? Well circumscribed lesion with some kind of artifactual changes around it. This patient does not give a history of trauma yet. This is a foreign body. There's no doubt at all, right? Okay. Now going to extraocular muscles, you look at the size of the extraocular muscles relative to the other, other eye. And if both eyes have extraocular muscle involvement, you have to go by the impression of what is normal shape of the extraocular muscle is it thickened is it thickened uniformly is it fusiform thickening if the thickening spares the insertion of the extraocular muscle where exactly is the most bulbous part of the lesion or the thickened extraocular muscle bilateral 
unilateral, which muscle is involved, which muscle is not involved. What about the muscle margin itself? Is the muscle margin smooth or if it is moth eaten or irregular? And if there is any contrast enhancement. Now, what about this, Ruju? Sir, it's a uh, um, bilateral uh, medial rectus and lateral rectus thickening hmm. uh, with sparing of the tendons and involvement of muscle belly. Uh, most likely due to thyroid eye disease. Muscle belly in the posterior two thirds, correct? Yes. Yeah, and bilateral, nearly symmetrical with crowding at the orbital apex, suggestive of thyroid orbital disease. And what is Barrett's muscle index? Not really done so much, but it is important to know. It's an indicator of or a, a predictor of dysthyroid optic neuropathy, where A is the thickness of the superior rectus, B is the thickness of the inferior rectus, C is the interorbital distance exactly at the point where you measure A and B. A plus B divided by C multiplied by 100, that's for vertical. D is the thickness of the medial rectus. E is the thickness of the lateral rectus. F is the interorbital distance at the same point. D plus E divided by F multiplied by 100. If it's more than 67%, then this is predictor of an impending dysthyroid optic neuropathy. This indirectly indicates crowding of the posterior orbit. Subha, what about this? This is thick and inferior rectus muscle, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Where exactly is the thickening more predominant now? In the anterior one third. Absolutely. So anterior two thirds. In thyroid, we saw that most of the thickening doesn't all books. I mean, obviously diseases don't read books. So you expect thickening in thyroid disease to be in the posterior two thirds. But we have patients who have thickening uniformly. So more in the anterior part of the muscle, all that is fine, but typically in the posterior two-thirds. But whenever a patient has more of thickness in the anterior two-third of the muscle, it's unlikely to be thyroid eye disease, especially if one muscle is involved. So this looks like an infiltrative process or a myositis, depending on the age of the individual. If this patient were to be 70 plus and coming to you with ocular motility, relatively normal yet thickened extraocular muscle, then you go in for an infiltrative process such as lymphoma or metastasis of the extraocular muscle. Whereas if it were to be a young individual who comes to you with ocular motility restriction, which is severe, and when you do force dexion test, it is tight, then that is supposed to be more likely to be myositis, especially if it is associated with uh, pain on movement of the eye. Now, this is also a patient who is elderly, who is like 70 plus, who comes with medial rectus thickening. And you can also note that thickening is likely less on the, in the anterior one third, and it is more on the posterior two thirds simulating thyroid disease. But the insertion of the extraocular muscle is grossly thicker. And this is how it clinically looks. You can see that there is chemosis of the connectiva. So, and his other eye is also congested and he seems to have some amount of blood retraction. Putting it all together, you may go in favor of a atypical thyroid disease with only the medial rectus muscle thickened with eyelid retraction, etc. And you may order T3, T4, TSH, all that, he has some amount, looks like he has some proptotic eye and he has some activity of the disease, caruncle being congested and temporal bulba conjunctiva being congested on, even on the left side. But when you look at this chemosis, it is very striking. On slit lamp, you find that it is solid chemosis, not the kind of inflammatory chemosis that you find in thyroid disease, which immediately makes you suspect looking at his age, he is unlikely to have thyroid disease. And also solid chemosis is in favor of lymphoma. And he has, this is at the time of his extraocular muscle biopsy, that he indeed has a fleshy thickening of the extraocular muscle. In such patients, when you biopsy, always biopsy along the axis of the muscle, never against it, so that you preserve the tectonic integrity of the muscle. If you biopsy against the axis of the muscle, then the muscle will be torn. So you go to the thickest part of the muscle, never go full thickness, take out about half or two-thirds thick of the extraocular muscle 
right in the middle of the muscle and suture it back so that the tectonic integrity of the muscle can be retained when the patient is treated the muscle actually regresses back to its normal size now this is a patient who has sudden onset pain but at the same time she has ocular motility restriction as well with thickening of gross thickening of the medial rectus muscle which almost looks like a tumor what is this cystic sclerosis sclerosis because you see a nice circular lesion with a endosity in the center suggestive of scolex so looking at the shape and size and the configuration of the extraocular muscle most likely you will be able to diagnose many of the muscle related problems on scans now uh, lits lacrimal gland of course lits you don't have to image really but lacrimal gland will need the help of imaging so basically in lacrimal gland you will not be able to see anything much except the architecture of the lesion whether it is variegated or not and also bony changes and the extent of the lesion whether it's cross the midline or not depending on that and the age of the patient etc you may be able to differentiate one lacrimal gland lesion from the other such as pleomorphic adenoma is generally never crosses the midline of the orbit it forms a nice scalloping um, architecture of the uh, bone or it causes fossa formation whereas adenoid cystic carcinoma would cause erosion of the bone and crosses the midline in intracranial structures we look at the optic nerve and the superior ophthalmic vein you may not be able to get the entire optic nerve in one scan unless you ask the radiologist to uh, scan the optic nerve you can see that there is some amount of discontinuity when you actually to the coronal scans i mean axial scans but when you really want the optic nerve then the it has to be slightly obliquely oriented so that in one cut you get the entire optic nerve so you have to specifically request the radiologist for an optic nerve scan now in optic nerve scan this is an earlier patient where where has been really don't do ct scan for retinoblastoma any more you can see that this optic nerve is absolutely normal in thickness whereas the left optic uh, left optic nerve is grossly thickened right up to the orbital apex indicating that this is a patient with retinoblastoma with optic nerve involvement already did you so uh, this is a tram track sign mm -hmm. uh, so basically uh, around the optic nerve um there is a hyperdense lesion seen indicating that there is a optic nerve sheath lesion treatment it's an optic nerve sheath lesion optic it nerve is. itself being normal right so this is typically called tram track sign and it is typical of optic nerve sheath meningioma perineuritis can also cause this optic nerve sheath lymphomatous infiltration leukemic in infiltration can also look like this what is this ruju subo so the angulation of the scleral cord is um, instead of being the normal 150 it is now 90 which is called tenting mm. it's indicative of stretch neuropathy or so stretch neuropathy because of either thyroid disease or acute orbital cellulitis you know we had many cases of orbital mucomycosis coming with tent sign tenting just indicates that there is so much of intraorbital pressure which is not just stretching the optic nerve but is also pressing on the eyeball to the extent that there is coning of the eyeball you can see nice coning of the eyeball in both these situations this is a patient with thyroid disease whereas this is a patient with mucomycosis now that's of course a very famous dilated superior ophthalmic vein and that's the scan that i began this talk with cella and paracella lesions of course mri is possibly the best but you will get fair amount of idea now finally again coming to the primary indications for ct scan trauma is a definite specific indication suspected foreign body is a definite specific indication whereas orbital tumors ct scan is a screening tool it will not tell you so much information as an mri scan does so we do ct scan uh, 
to especially in lacrimal gland tumors etc or where you want to really cut the bone then you may want some information from the ct scan otherwise mri is very useful for orbital tumors bony lesions primarily you would want a ct scan and then if required an mri calcific lesions again ct scan is better intraocular tumors generally we don't rely on ct scan we do either ultrasound b scan direct visualization of the tumor of course and mri scan so these are the indications for ct scan mri is definitely better than ct because it does not have any ionizing radiation it provides better soft tissue resolution in most of the orbital tumors in fact by the latest data about 85% of orbital lesions are soft tissue lesions which have no relationship to the bone at all in only about 15 to 20% of patients you may have a soft tissue lesion related to the bone and their ct scan may have a role and there is there are no beam hardening artifacts mri is better than ct for lesions which are around the optic canal and orbital fissures non expanding lesions of the optic nerve any lesion with intracranial extension mri is a definitely a much better option mri is inferior to the ct in some aspects because it has motion artifacts poor spatial resolution chemical shift artifacts is of the artifacts bone details not seen with clarity it is only guessed or attributed calcific lesions can be missed and traumatic lesions in foreign body where you don't know the nature of the foreign body if it's a magnetic foreign body then you may be in trouble if you order a mri scan last bit is about the role of combining positron emission tomography with ct scan it provides morphological and metabolic information about possible malignancies especially if you're looking for a metastasis or if you're looking for an occult a primary then it is very important that you ask for a whole body or head and neck pet ct scan it has a role in diagnosing staging and restaging orbital malignancies or metastasis from a distant primary so in conclusion i would they say that last week of course we completed mri this is a combined conclusion i would say ct scan and mri are extremely useful imaging tools without which you cannot be an oculoplasty surgeon you should try to understand how to read a ct scan and also an mri mri is more technical you would definitely need the help of a radiologist in helping you understand and read an mri a lot of hand holding is required before you start reading mri even um, relatively confidently whereas ct scan you can actually take off reading a ct scan without much difficulty because it is more intuitive and it is what you see is what you interpret there are no hidden meanings in a ct scan where mri would have a lot of technical issues which i fail to understand uh, critically you definitely need a radiologist for an mri ct scan is a screening tool for most of us based on which you would advise further investigations and whenever you advise a ct scan you have to specify appropriate parameters otherwise the technician may do something and you may get that for you to interpret systemic interpretation by the ophthalmologist and correlation with clinical information actually helps you triage a patient diagnose a patient and formulate a surgical plan thank you so much thank you so much sir for a wonderful lecture and a deep insight into the ct of uh, orbits uh so can we take the questions right now sir so the first question one of the you can ask uh, ravi to comment if he could add something uh good evening ravi verma sir are you on the panel okay you can take the question maybe we'll come back sure sir so uh, the first question is the role of ct scan in vascular malformations Yeah, in vascular malformation, it is a screening tool. Of course, in say dural cavernous fistula, keratico cavernous fistula, you will find a dilated superior ophthalmic vein and thickened extraocular muscles. So you will be able to diagnose it. But if you really want to do therapeutic interventions, then MRI, MRI with contrast or CT angio would be helpful. So just a plain CT scan or CT scan with contrast will just be able to help you diagnose a condition. but not treat the patient or take decision regarding treatment and uh, for cavernous hemangioma this is fine but 
well circumscribed straightforward cavernous hemangioma you know the location of the lesion but you may not know its exact relationship to the optic nerve whether it is really adherent to the optic nerve sheath whether it is free from it all that information you may not get readily with a ct scan but if it's a straightforward extra conal suprotemporal cavernous hemangioma just based on the ct scan you may be able to operate on it for a veno lymphatic malformation if you find fibulitis etc and irregular lobulated lesion you may be able to give intralesional injection based just on ct scan you may not need an mri scan and for orbital varices if the clinical diagnosis is fairly evident ct scan is only supportive you may not really need an mri scan in orbital varices but for other complex lesions you will definitely need an mri scan so the second question is in differentiating a coats disease versus an atypical retinoblastoma the need for taking ct sections in a screening with mri of the orbits not i mean see mri in coats disease would tell you that there is a proteinaceous fluid subretinal fluid which will have a higher uh, content of protein as compared to serous exudative retinal detachment so if your radiologist is able to give you that information then that is suggestive of coats disease apart from speckles of calcification so all this would come in handy when you cannot see the fundus reliably if you can see the fundus and if you already made up your mind that it is coats disease and your only intention is to rule out atypical retinoblastoma then all you would need is a ct scan to know the calcification in coats disease you find only very rare specks of calcification whereas in retinoblastoma you find dense mounds of calcification so if you really cannot see a tumor which you suspect is not endophytic but exophytic and is masked by a high bullous retinal detachment right up to the lens that is an indication for a ct scan otherwise you really don't need imaging in a coats disease so i have a follow up question so last week only we had a case uh, in which ct scan was done uh, intraocular mass was there uh, it was diagnosed as retinoblastoma but it did not show any calcification on the ct in mm -hmm. fact i had taken uh, my sir's opinion also so sir in uh, retinoblastoma sir is it possible that because it's diffuse infiltrative uh, yeah, calcification absolutely in older children if it's diffuse infiltrative retinoblastoma then calcification is rarely seen i would not say it is never seen it is seen but it is rarely seen so older children diffuse infiltrative retinoblastoma you don't even find a mass right all you find is diffuse thickening of the retina which even sometimes mri fails to diagnose so anterior retinoblastoma diffuse infiltrative retinoblastoma are mainly clinical diagnosis and you cannot certainly rely on imaging to diagnose Right. So, Bob, any more questions? Yeah. So, the role of uh, CT scan in uh, a colobomatous microphthalmos, apart from ruling out an orbital palpebral cyst. Right. So, role of CT scan in colobomatous microphthalmos is that uh, one is that you know the size of the eye. Second is whether you have a optic disc coloboma and also a optic nerve cyst. that is one more information that you get third is you know the size of the orbit whether there is bony contraction or not so if a patient has no visual potential at all and has a patient has a microphthalmic eye then you can advise parents accordingly that this child does not have any visual potential do you want to leave it alone or do you want us to take measures to symmetrize cosmosis suppose you don't do anything at that stage and let the child grow into an adult the child will have a permanent facial asymmetry because there is no stimulus for the bony orbit to grow the child will have permanent mid facial asymmetry right lower face will develop normally but around the orbit there would definitely be asymmetry so if you want to take measures to treat it then it's a good idea to get a scan and then see if there is bony contraction already with the microphthalmic eye so that you can advise parents to go in for enucleation with an orbital implant 
which will stimulate growth of the bone. So these may these are some of the indications for a CT scan. Of course, there are syndromes called Joubert syndrome, etc., corpus callosum, hypoplasia. Those can be picked up only on an MRI scan or can be picked up on a CT scan, but that can be a screening tool. Uh, one of the um, audience, Dr. Dhanalakshmi has asked, what is the role of CT in a patient presenting with a superior sulcus fullness? Superior sulcus fullness could be because of anything, right? From fat prolapse to blephrochalysis to dermatochalysis, superior orbital mass. So if you're suspecting anything in the orbit, either because of proptosis, displacement of the eye, restriction of ocular motility, or say relative resistance or retropulsion, then you expect that CT scan or imaging would reveal something. If you think it is only a lid or a septal or a immediate post-septal problem, then there may not be an indication for a scan unless you suspect anterior orbital non-specific or specific inflammation. That's all the questions for uh, tonight, sir. Mm -hmm. Before we call it a day, uh, I would like to make a small announcement for the next week. The next class is on essentials of ophthalmic research and publications by Dr. Sabesachi Sen Gupta, which is on 28th of June at 8 p.m. Thank you all. Good all right. night. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night, sir.